work hard, learn as much as you can, and have fun. I would say those are my top three things. If you can do that, you've had a good career. Welcome to Hearts and Carts, the CPG podcast, the podcast about the people behind the products that are winning hearts and filling carts. This cast is for anyone with an interest in the world of consumer products. We're your hosts, Justin Osborne and Alex Hill, and our mission is to bring you weekly content that helps you be a better and more informed CPG professional. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Hearts and Cards. We had a really exciting episode today. Alex, who do we have on the show? Today, we're going to be chatting with Jamie Griffiths, who is the Vice President of Sales for Matt and Steve's. Now, for those who aren't familiar, Matt and Steve's is a manufacturer in the pickles business, marinated vegetables, famous for their extreme beans. They sell into food service and retail both in the United States and Canada, and their portfolio is expanding, a Canadian success story. So without further ado, we can move ourselves into that conversation. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow us on the various social platforms, and let's jump into our conversation with Jamie. Hey, Hey, Jamie. How's it going, boys? Good, man. How are you doing? surviving living living the dream <laughs> one day at a time eh? one day at a time yeah everything's uh everything's changed since the last time i saw you guys how are you guys doing good doing great man doing great yeah yeah i think we're both dads since last time you saw us so yeah that's out that's out of the layer <laughs> yeah yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a good layer or a bad layer some days but it's, it's yeah it's, it's a good uh, layer by and large by yeah. and large but it's a busy layer it's a yeah, busy layer yeah. for sure, right? Yeah. How a, many do you guys have now? One, two, just one. one. Yeah, you boys are rookies. I've got three, so I'm veteran. How do you guys? Man. <laughs> Somehow you still look better than us. I don't understand. I don't get it. I I feel like <laughs> my hair completely went gray when Leo was born. I'm tired all the time. You look the exact same. What a the heck? Just, a little just for men. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> touch a touch of gray. Maybe I need a little bit of touch of gray. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not so bad. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate that. Thanks for oh, joining, thanks dude. Thanks for being here. So let, let's introduce you first. So we have Jamie Griffiths with us, who is the Vice President of Sales at Matt and Steve's. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know Jamie from working with him at SC Johnson a number of years ago. And just an amazing career path that he's had sort of on the, the retailer side and large CPG, moving over to smaller CPG. He was one of the first people that I remember moving to smaller CPG. And so excited to have you on to talk about that that unique journey. I think maybe just you can start us off by by talking about it a little bit. Talk, talk about the beginning of your career, getting out of school. What did you start doing and, and why? Yeah. Yeah, I'll back it up to like how I kind of got into retail. Yeah. It was, really, it was a it was a weird kind of experience. So my my uncle at the time, this is back in like 90, 91, 92, he started this, um, he had a store and it, it sold like West Indian food. So food of the Caribbean, a little bit of Asian food as well too in, in Scarborough. So my mom became the manager of the store. So my mom would work from literally from like eight o'clock in the morning, shut store down to like 10 at night. So my dad would come home and like, you know, pick me up, bring me to the store. So I would always help her out. And um, so I spent, you know, when I was 11, 10 years old, I spent a lot of time growing up in retail, which was crazy. Like the store would be closed. My mom would be counting the cash at the end of the night. And she would tell me, like, go around the whole store and make sure that all the labels like just weird things like that. Right. And um, and and that's when I started, you know, getting a little bit of a love for retail as a whole. Um, I would see, you know, suppliers coming into the store, talking to my mom and like back in the day, like wheeling and dealing, right? Like, yeah, yeah. oh yeah. take seven skids of rice and I'll give you some leaf tickets. Like that's (laughs) that's what it was, right? The good old days, the good old days of bartering, right? So yeah, that's when when I I got my first glimpse into it. It, It's always been really in our family. 
Um, there's some, there's a lot of entrepreneurs on my, on my mom's side of the family. So that's how I started getting into it. Then I went to school. I went to uh, university and got my degree in, in marketing. So my, my aspirations were to be this uh, chic marketing executive that lived in like Manhattan, right? Like just <laughs> I had that life. That was, yeah. that was the life that I wanted. But then I, I I minored in psychology. And the reason why I minored in psychology is that I, I figured if I could trick people in terms of understanding how they thought, I would be a better marketer. So I kind of compiled that, uh, went to school uh, for four years and then left and finished it up and left and then um, got into the Hudson's Bay Company through a yeah. training program where you, you, know, you spend about a year in the stores and then they bring you into head office in order to go into like the planning side. Or if you wanted to be a buyer, I always had aspirations of being a buyer. And I was there from 2005 to 2009. So I spent some time there. Mm -hmm. um, but again, but really, you know, working in a store is much different than working in an office in, at the Bay, right? Like you're yeah. dealing with customers and, and you're, and you're uh, dealing in a different element. So that really grounded me, you know, going back home. I had an assignment where, you know, I was, I, I grew up in Pickering for the later part of my, my, my life. And, um, I went back home and I was at the local Zellers and I'm doing carryouts and all my buddies, you know, they all saw me and they're like, Oh, last time we heard you, you went to university and now you're, you know, carrying up. <laughs> you're like, it was like, you guys don't get it. Like I'm, I'm trying to understand, like, you know, yeah. you back to the roots and and that's, you have to understand what happens. Um, that hey, Jamie. Really yeah. For, for our listeners, can you explain what a carryout is? Yeah, it's, it's essentially, it's, you know, you're carrying out a barbecue. Like, so when, you know, yep. Ethel comes in and says, Hey, I can't bring this barbecue out to my car. Mm -hmm. They'll page up Jamie and Jamie comes from the back. He's running, he's running across the store and he, he brings it out. So, um, you know, large furniture, bikes, uh, all those kind of things. So I was working in the seasonal department. So, um, so I had some, some challenges there. Gained a little muscle by picking up yeah. a lot right. of stuff. <laughs> Got to do it. Yeah. And then um, and then after that, then I started getting into, um, uh, went over to Sobeys um, and became a category manager over there for a couple of the desks. So cereal, hot breakfast, uh, meal makers, which would include your condiments and pickles and everything else. And spent some time there, which was really cool. Uh, I learned a lot. I would say, you know, the number two things I, I learned out of Sobeys was how to negotiate and teamwork. I, I would say the team that we had there when I was there was, you know, all the category managers knew each other. We all went to each other's wedding at the time. We were all, you know, going through that phase of life. And 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 I really enjoyed myself. Awesome. What were the differences like? So going from Hudson Bay to Sobeys, right? Both retailers, but very different retailers. Totally. Like in what they sell, where they're located, everything about them, right? So what was yeah. the, the main difference? I mean, the main difference at the time, I would say looking back now, it's I think the Bay had a little bit more of that poshy selling. So we would go mm. to a market in New York and, um, you know, stay in Manhattan for four days. And, you know, you're 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 going through and you pick. I was looking after watches at the time. So, you know, you were going through like, oh, what face looks good. This strap looks good. Yeah. And at Sobeys, it was really like you were at store level and, and it wasn't as, as what they would call glamorous. Mm. Um, you were really a, a negotiator, but you were also a curator for, you know, your portfolio and, and what your, what your, um, what your set looked like. I would, I would also say, you know, Sobeys was a lot more analytical with mm. AC Nielsen mm. information. Um, yeah. We had a lot of that good insights there. And, and that's where I learned to be a lot more analytical, I would say. Uh, and just in terms of understanding how to use uh, proper insights and and information in order to make decisions, right? Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, and then from Sobeys, I went over to Walmart head office in Canada. Um, I was there for 2012 to 2015. So that was that was a really unique, different experience. Um, you know, the 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 big thing I I would say that I learned from there was strategy how to build a strategy from ground up. That was essentially my role was to be the person that builds the strategy with the fresh side and also the, the grocery side as well too. So, um, and I did a ton of traveling with them and I got crazy exposure into, uh, you know, how the behemoth of, of, of Walmart yeah. works in the U S in Bentonville. Um, there's not a lot to do down there, but Walmart. So <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I have been there. It's, it's something. 
yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's different. It's, it's yeah, it's different. So, um, but yeah, so I, I, you know, Walmart was was great, and then uh, my last stop uh, was was Essie Johnson, and that's when I met you two jokers. Um, <laughs> best and- part of your career. Yeah, that was the best. That was, that, was the, that was the highlight of my career, right there. Yeah, yeah, and so, so Walmart. So you're kind of going on that retailer side, right? Having a successful career, building bigger portfolios, moving up the ladder, becoming a director, all of that. Um, and then you make the decision to go to SC Johnson to go on the other side. Um, so why, why make that jump over? Yeah, that was a. Um... That was a jump that I felt that I could add value to um, any supplier that I went over to because, you know, for the last eight to 10 years, I was on the other side of the desk. I was the one yeah. that was making the decision saying, you know, I'm going to list this product or I'm not going to list this product and here are the reasons why. Mm-hmm. So um, moving over into the vendor side. So I, I when I was at Walmart, I also built a lot of great friendships with a lot of the people that were actually on the supplier side. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the Maple Leafs of the world and Procter and Gamble, and, and I, tr- I tried to understand how they worked. So my, my role at Walmart was, it was almost a hybrid. I was working on the strategy part for Walmart head office, but I was also liaisoning between the supplier as well too. So I was, mm-hmm. I was almost like Switzerland. I was like neutral, right? Mm-hmm. So I was in the middle. So to be able to build these strategies out and what a four-year or five-year strategy looks like with Procter & Gamble or Maple Leaf or yeah. Unilever. So it really intrigued me. And I, I learned a little bit um, along that way, but I, I felt that if I went to the supplier side, I could just add a little bit more value um, and, and, and a point of differentiation, to be honest with you. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Newborn. Yeah. Alrighty. So now you're at SCJ and, and and what exactly did you do there? Yeah. So that I would say was all about processes. It was uh, <laughs> coming on and, and working with the sales, the sales team, figuring out what that process is, um, what that, what that right process is, if there was any opportunities, really getting analytical and looking at, you know, are there any gaps? Uh, and then talking uh, to our team, you know, sales, I was, I was kind of in the middle working with sales, marketing, replenishment, um, just to make sure that from a, a sales operational standpoint, there was there was consistency when we're working at, a, at an optimal level. So, you know, the number one thing I took away from SC Johnson was process. And then in the latter half, I went on to the sales side um, and was calling on Sobeys and was calling on as well. And I, I started, you know, the whole Miss Myers e-com was, mm-hmm. was, yes, that was a big thing and ethnic as well, too. So um yeah and 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 at that point then uh i uh i made the decision to go over to matt and steve's which is a a big decision at that time let everyone know first of all what what you're doing at matt and steve's and a little bit about matt and steve's for those who aren't familiar with the products yeah so uh matt and steve so we were known for our, our, our famous product is called the extreme bean it's a pickled green bean used for snacking, primarily used for Caesars as well, too. Uh, that's how a lot of people know us. We started off in the food service business, so bars and restaurants. And then um, from that, it was really paid tra- uh, sampling. So um, with Matt and Steve's, you know, really working on food service, there was this opportunity uh, to go into retail. And the funny story behind that was, as I mentioned before, when I was a category manager over at Sobeys, I actually met Matt and Steve. I was mm. the first category manager and retailer to bring them, you know, to, to a bigger scope. Um, so they came in and, you know, Matt can attest, Matt and Steve can attest that um, they had probably one of the worst presentations that I've ever seen. <laughs> they were so unpolished, <laughs> but just regular dudes and regular guys. And, and there was something intrigued. I was intrigued with them um, just because I just thought they were so authentic in terms of what mm. they were trying to do the passion behind what they were trying to, to accomplish. Um, so I stayed, you know, over that time, I stayed friends with Matt for the, for the next five to t- five to seven years. And, you know, we would talk to each other on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, you know, I was talking about a different, I, I've, I've always been an entrepreneur at heart. So there was these things that I was working on um, personally. And uh, I told Matt and I said, you know, I've got this idea that I'm working on. I want to sit down with you and pick your brain. So uh, we went out to dinner 
And we talked and I told him a little bit what I was on and um, he came back and I, I think I sold him on me versus what, what I wanted what to do was sell him on the idea and get some help on terms of what I was doing. But um, we talked and he said, listen, I've got this opportunity for you. Um, and uh, I'd love for you to come over and just really spearhead sales. We really don't have somebody that's really looking after sales and spearhead that and, and, and go away with it. So, you know, one conversation happened after another and, uh, we made it work and that's when I, uh, that's when I left. So, um, currently right now in my position, I'm the VP of sales. So I look after beverages, which we have now, I look after food service and I looked after the U S food and Canadian retail. So. Awesome. Yeah. I, I actually, in a, in a past life used to, used to make Caesars at a bar with Matt and Steve's Did you? Uh, at the keg. So I, I believe you guys still have the account. The keg is one of our best customers. They're a good one. They're a they, good one. And they make a really, really good Caesar. They don't get crazy with it. It's just a classic Caesar. And that's why I think yeah. a lot of people go there, but yeah, they're, they're a great account. I also did see you guys at beer fest this year. Yes. Yes. I, I looked for you. I didn't see you at the booth, but no, I wasn't there, but Steve was there with a couple others. Um, Steve really brings the, the energy. Um, I'm the sales guy. He is the life of the party. He will tell you how they started and, and everything else. So he really brings the fun and, and excitement, but yeah, we, um, that was an investment that we, uh, that we looked at, um, you know, specifically geared towards trying to get trial into the LCBO. Yeah. Um, with a certain demographic. So I, I, I mean, it, it from what I understand, it, it did really well. Hey, so question for you. Yeah. Making that jump, obviously you had a relationship and, you know, that probably makes it a little more natural. Yeah. Uh, but for someone looking to make a jump like that, any tips, you know, in terms of finding that match, finding, um, you know, a position, uh, a ne negotiating and yeah. all that, any, any, any guidance you'd give? I would say, to be honest with you guys, it is. Um, so at, at that time, when I made the jump over, there was a lot of things going on um, at SC Johnson. You know, I was on the high potential list, right? Everybody <laughs> knows that list. Oh. Yeah. High low list, right? Yeah. And um, I had a newborn. My son was just born. Um, I was coming off of, you know, winning a um, uh, an award in the industry. Like things were going up. But I also looked at, you know, what does long-term look like, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I would say the number one advice is you have to be confident enough to bet on yourself. So I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Matt didn't know what he was getting some, himself into, but we both had alignment on what we wanted for ourselves or what we wanted for our families. We had these open, honest conversations about it. And um, I felt like, you know, if I worked my ass off, I'd be able to accomplish a lot with the company and with him. And we would go on this ride together. So, you know, you really got to understand, like, are you that person that is going to, you have to have that type of entrepreneurial flair, but there's also a lot of risk with that, right? Mm -hmm. I, I still have a lot of friends that work in larger CPG companies and they, and they love it, right? And there's a comfort behind that right? Mm -hmm. um, but their day-to-day -day is a lot different than mine, right? So if I were to say my day-to-day -day versus somebody then, you know, in a larger CPG uh, company, it, it it sounds and it looks a little bit different, right? And you mm -hmm. have to be a certain type of person in order to be able to handle a lot of the stresses that come along with it when you're working and you're, you're, you're essentially in charge of somebody's livelihood and their family's livelihood, which would be Matt and Steve's. Um, there's a lot more pressure on you. Right. And yeah. some people can deal with the pressure and some people can't. Yeah. So I think I think, you know, for your listeners, you'd have to figure out, are you that do you have those characteristics in order to do that? If you do have if you do have that and you do believe that you have that, I think you have to understand the company and and, and the founders and, and and who they are at their core. That made it a lot more easier for me to transition over it because I did have a relationship with Matt. But I think that's a, a an important piece is, you know. Yeah. Talk to them about, you know, how they are, not just from a business standpoint, but just from a human standpoint. Yeah. Right? Get to know them um, because that's the, that's the people that you're going to be seeing on a day to day basis. And, you know, pardon my, my, my French, but when shit hits the fan, like you're going to have to be in a yeah. room with them dealing with all the crap that's happening. But then vice versa, when stuff's really going good, you're going to be in the room and you guys are partying and <laughs> high fives yeah. and having yeah. drinks and, you know, doing whatever. So 
if you can, I, I would say really reach out and just understand who who the people you're working with that you're potentially. Visiting. I guess in comparison to to like moving from the Bay to Sobeys or Sobeys to Walmart or Walmart to Essie Johnson, like all of those, like they're kind of you know what they are and you go and you're kind of trying to impress in an interview. But when you're doing something like this, yeah. the interview is very much two ways yeah. versus something like that, like a, a more traditional job. Yeah. No. I, I, yeah. Uh, and I would say, you know, for me, what I've, what I've, what I've felt in this position, which I like and which I thrive off of is, you know, you're always in a paranoia anxiety state to, to somewhat because mm-hmm. You're always thinking about what's next. That's your job. You're always thinking about mm-hmm. what's next. If I've got to fill the pipeline with sales, I've got to be thinking five to five months to a year out, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And some people are just not built for that, to be honest mm-hmm. with you, right? Like yeah. some people, I always look at it at sports. It's like some people don't want the ball with three seconds left and it's a it's a tied ball game. Like yeah. who wants the ball, right? Yeah. And I've always been one of those people where I like to bet on myself um, and a little bit confident in what I do. But again, like we've all, this is a craft, right? Mm-hmm. Like you've yep. all spent time and hours on working on this craft. Um, sales is a craft. Um, it's no different than, than the other skill sets out there. So you got to be really confident in yourself and your abilities in order to perform, especially when you're working for somebody else's money. Yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah, definitely. So you, you talked about, um, well, I guess two things. One, I think maybe I should have interviewed Alex more before we did this podcast together. That's the first thing. <laughs> but, um, now, I'm, now I'm thinking, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know anything about him. But um, the second thing is around your, your days themselves, because you sort of touched on it, right? What I found from going from SEJ to smaller company was that you go from like super structured days, you know, nine hour work day, eight hours or me. <laughs> and it's like years of meaningful time. Then you go to a smaller company and it's like your calendar's free, but it's you just got to figure out how to grow the business. Yeah. So what are your days like now? Like how do you structure them? Um, what do you spend a majority of your time doing? Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Because you know, one of the things that we don't do uh, at Matt and Steve's is we don't have a lot of meetings, internal meetings. We we've got a meeting at 906 and it's literally 15 minutes. It's the senior executive teams. We talk about metrics, we talk about our wins, we talk about our top priorities, and we talk about our challenges. And after that 15 minute, mi- minutes, gone. So I know what's going on in Matt's world. I know what's going on in Steve's world. Yeah. I know what's going on from a finance perspective. I know what's going on from an operations perspective. They all know the challenges or you know what I'm dealing with. Um, so that's how we start every every morning. We have that 906, that 906 because it keeps everybody aligned in, in terms of what's going on. Yeah, um, we do not have internal, you know, I've worked in like six hours of things a day, yeah. right? Um, it's yeah. not like that. But how do I fill my uh, my calendar? Well, I mean, it's based off of priorities. My I'm being in sales. I use the the hunting, the hunter and farmer uh, mm-hmm. analogy. So, you know, just to give your, your uh, listeners a little bit of uh, knowledge on what hunting and farming is. So the way that we break it down is like in sales, you've got the hunting aspect, which is they're essentially going out to kill, get the next meal, fill your pipeline, um, talk to the major guys, the retailers, work on distribution, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the farming standpoint, this is all about like, you know, going over the financials, making sure your trade spend is is correct. You're not overspending on trade, doing forecasting. Um, it's a lot more internal work. Analytical work is what I would say. Um, and that's how I really split out my days. And to be honest with you guys, it 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 flows there are days when i'll wake up and uh i hit the gym and i had a really good workout and i feel good and i'm pumped and i will spend six hours in my office hunting just calling people up um thinking about ideas and you know researching and researching the company and trying to find out who the you know the the points of contacts are and then i have kind of so-so days where i just want to sit drink a coffee in my office and just go through the numbers and the data and just see what's going on. So um, that's essentially how my, my, my week goes. It could be, you know, three days of hunting, um, two days of farming. It could be three days of farming, two days of hunting. It all depends on what the business needs. But at that, you know, as I referred to before, the 906 meetings, you kind of know what the business needs. Mm -hmm. You get a pulse check. So if sales are down, I'm going to start hunting yeah. just so I can make sure that my pipeline is is filled up in the next three, three months. And, you know, just because you call somebody and you get a meeting and, you know, they say, Hey, great. That's awesome. 
the sales actually don't come until five or six months down yeah. the line. Right. Yeah. So, you know, everybody, everybody, when I, when I come back and I'm like, Hey guys, I had this really great meeting and uh, they're going to take our product. They're like, yeah, that's great. We'll believe it when the PO comes, which should be in six <laughs> months. Right. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's constantly going. So I would say it, it really depends on, on the mindset and you can't, I, I would say you can't force that. You can't mm-hmm. force me to hunt for five days. Cause I will just get, you know, I'll just get burnt out. You'll burn out. Yeah. Yeah. And from a creative standpoint, it's very, very hard. So I'll take a couple days back and just, you know, by nature, I'm an introvert. So it's almost like those are my days where I can just sit, get back to my, you know, my, my being comfort and then go back out again and then just start selling. Right. Love it. Simple, but powerful. Plus you, you go out for five straight days, you'll start spending too much. You won't, you won't check the trade spend, you know, it's. (laughs) Somebody's got to be able to take care of home, Alex. You got to do it. You got (laughs) to, you got to tend the garden. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's ebb and flow, I I would say. Um, But I, I I love hunting. I I love, you know, the good and the bad with it. Um, Because once you're on, you know, you get a couple, get a couple hits and you're good. And it, it, it it really, and it ignites the team internally. It it ignites, you know, operations, operations gets Mm -hmm. up and they're like, oh, okay, awesome. Right. So I love hunting, but I know that from a farming perspective, you have to be able to control a lot of the spend because then the hunting is for nothing if you're not making money out of it, right? Yeah. Hey, so we chatted at the start about kids and you got you got a few. Talk talk to people about balancing what's been a really successful career and obviously like one that's uh, you know pretty demanding with family. Yeah, I think it has to do with discipline. So I'm I'm in the office from you know eight forty five until five o'clock. And then I shut it down. Like I'm literally, you will not find me unless it's an, an emergency. You will not find me on my computer. Um, mm-hmm. When my kids have basketball games, um, I'm there. I'm not the parent that's on the phone checking emails. <laughs> um, I can't be that that parent. Um, and and you know, I think it's. Um, I think I would. I would also say your spouse is a huge proponent in terms of managing your family and your work-life balance so you know my wife um she looks after everything like everything for our family including me as well too so um she is you know she's the number one thing that i have in her, in terms of managing my life so she's a beast she takes care of everything <laughs> so yeah could it, it, and, and when you have a partner that is aligned to what you're doing um and um and will support you it makes it easier so yeah you know, when home is in a good spot, it makes it easier for you yeah. to work, right? Totally. Um, and so you got to balance, you got to balance it both. There, there's some days when, you know, I'm having a really shitty day at work, but I go home and it's like, my kids are, you know, relatively behaving themselves and their homework's done. <laughs> and, you know, we can like, you know, hang out. Like uh, yeah. I'd say about half an hour before this, my, my daughters were, were showing me this, they were dancing to Madonna and talking to me about Thriller and Michael Jackson. And <laughs> it's just like, you dad, know, have you, have you heard this song before? Yeah. I've heard that one. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard of Michael Jackson? Yeah. I think I heard yeah. that. I heard of that <laughs> but yeah, it's, 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 and that, and again, so it's like, and then I can start my day again um, on a positive note. So I think that yeah. Having that balance and and ha- and working with a company that respects that is 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 key, right? But then there's some days when you know I'm on the road and I'm in the U.S. and I'm not home for three days, right? And yeah. um, and they've got to they've got to be able to to manage it here. And my wife does a really good job in terms of handling it here. But um, yeah, I, I would say it's really all about discipline and 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 putting. I would say bar none, you put your family first because if mm-hmm. your family's not first, you're gonna laugh. It, it it's gonna show from a work perspective. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, yep. And then I also think it's time management. If I can't do what I need to do, you know, from nine to five, I haven't done my job correctly and I have a time management <laughs> problem. Cause I go, like I, I go with like, you know, a hundred miles an hour yeah. throughout the day with no distractions. Um, and, and I get stuff done. And if I can't get it done in that time, uh, time allocation, then it, it, I'm not, I'm not managing my time and I'll look back and I'll say, okay, well, what can I change? It's like, you know, take it for the gym, for example, right? Somebody can go in the gym for an hour and a half and have an okay workout, whereas somebody can go in for 45 minutes and just have the best workout. 
It's all about managing and understanding what, you know, what workouts are best, right? You're going to do squats and you're going to do, you know, these fundamental larger body parts in order to get some, some blood flow going for the next 45 minutes where it's like, you know, in terms of just standing around and kind of checking your phone and then, you know, you're doing something else. It's like, it's all about time management. So um, discipline and time management, I would say is two keys. Yeah. The, the, the quote I like heard before that you, you basically mentioned, right. was like, you're replaceable at work. You're not replaceable at home. So it's important yeah. to remember that, like that your home life is your real life. The work <laughs> is important, enough. right? Like it's, it, you need money, you need food, you need a house, you need things, right? But it, it's one is clearly more important than the other. And that that's exactly what you said, right? And it's, it's important for people to hear that. I think even the like, younger in your career, there's like this thought around like sacrificing things in order to like climb the corporate ladder. So I think it's it's helpful for, for listeners to hear from some someone like yourself that's so successful, like, no, family needs to be first, right? Family, family needs to be first. And just remember this, you know, in the roles that we're all in, uh, we're, we're in a position and nobody cares about the player. They care about the position. So yeah. um, I've been on the side where I've gone into previous employers, now the seller for Matt and Steve's. Yes. And those guys, you know, I'm sitting in the in the lobby waiting for a meeting. And I remember one time somebody came up to me and they said, oh, you know, I, and again, I used to work with them. Oh, where are you working now? Well, I'm with Matt and Steve's. Oh, okay. You sell beans, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. And they were just like dogging me out. They're like, oh, you're selling beans. You're a bean guy now. Right. And it was just <laughs> like, I was like, okay, because it was, it's, it's at, at the time, the position that I was in allowed me to, um, you know, gives you some sort of a prestige with people and people yeah. will be different just based off of the position. There are a lot of yeah. people, to be honest with you guys, like there's a lot of people when I left, they, you know, I thought they were friends, but they never called me again. Right. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because of the person that I was, it was just the position that I was in. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just that, that's, that's the one thing that I would say is um, that I've learned, uh, you know, along the years is it's, it's the position. And I would say, you know, just to go back to that question in terms of um, the transition from, retail to supplier was the biggest thing that I saw that changed was your the power and ego. So when you were mm. in the retail set, <laughs> when you're in the retailer side, you're sitting there and you're like, yeah. yeah, I want this and I'll have a meeting with you and this and that. When you're on the supplier side, you are trying to get them, you know, to be aligned with you and and say yes, right? Which is yeah. it's totally two different things. So you know, you lose that power when you leave, when you lose, when you leave the retail, you lose that, that, that power at the time. But, um, you know, I, I, I think it was, I know, I know for me and just my style and, and who I am, it, it was the right decision to make. It. Good. All right. Let, let's, um, let's talk more about Matt and Steve's. I'm, I'm curious to hear from you. We talked about food service, the keg, um, how important that is to your business, how that, that's how your business started. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think a lot of people don't have experience in the food service space. So maybe chat a little bit about uh, the differences between direct selling to retailers and food service. Yeah. So food service um, usually is you're, you're going through a distributor. Um, so, you know, in Canada, the larger guys would be the Cisco's and the GFS and the Flanagan's of the world. So, you know, they buy your product and then they sell it to the keg, right? Mm -hmm. Um, or they'll sell it to Moxie's or Boston Pizza, et cetera. That's the big difference. Um, the other thing that I would say is a big difference with food service versus retail is you don't have the ability to um, change customer habit habits. So I don't really have the ability for a consumer to go into the keg and drink more Caesars. I don't. Mm. What I do have the ability on the retail side is for a Justin to, you know, walk across the aisle, call it a Loblaws or Sobeys, et cetera. And he sees a, a, a promo price tag, two for eight. I can, I can influence him to buy two jars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's different tactics that I can use at retail, which I don't yeah. have at food service. Um, food service, you know, really is all about making sure that you have um, the right supply. Number one, in this day and age, it's all about supply. Right. Mm -hmm. Um but they're very different though. Like they're, they're very different. I love food service because it's, it's paid sampling for us, right? Somebody tries mm -hmm. our bean at the mm -hmm. keg, they look at it, you know, they might see it on the bar fridge and then they they'll recognize it in stores. Um, yeah. 
right? So it food service is very, very good um, in terms of just understanding and using paid sampling um, to fuel retail. So what we found is in markets where we have a lot of food service, our retail is that much stronger, which is mm. different mm. than the U.S. We don't have food service with the exception of Florida. We don't really have food service in the U.S. In the U.S., we took a different approach. We went straight to retail, right? Interesting. So, um, but we're seeing what we're seeing a difference though. It, the tactics in terms of how to how to get that bottle of, of or, or that jar of beans to fly off shelf is very much different U.S. versus Canada, right? So, I think mm -hmm. even for your listeners to understand the U.S. business versus the Canadian business, it's it's different. It's a little bit different as well too. In, in Canada, we go direct for our, to our retailers. We don't use distributors. Mm -hmm. So we, um, we go direct. So, which is, uh, you know, which is a good thing. So we, you know, we control the pricing, um, sent off to, to the retailer. So it's a little bit easier for us. And then in the U S let's, let's, uh, unpack that a bit more, like aside from distributors, like what, what's been the experience? Um, and when did that start? That started, um, that was my main role coming into when I first started. Um, so we already had, when I came to Matt and Steve's, we already had, um, Walmart, Loblaws, you know, the big four, big five in Canada. Um, I, I thought there was an opportunity in the U S, um, just because I thought we had really good product mm -hmm. and, uh, sat down with Matt and Steve and they said, listen, you've got, it, it was almost like, you know, you've got this blank canvas, a white canvas, just draw, create art, figure it out, just go and figure it out. So they gave me, um, full reign to go and figure it out. And uh, I paid a ton of listing fees, but <laughs> <laughs> but I figured it out. Hey, I figured it out. Um, hey, it works. So, yeah. So for two years, I was I was battling listing fees with uh, internally with finance. But you know, I figured it out. And again, I, I was scrappy with it. I went to Kroger Direct. I went to um, Albertsons and Safeway. Like I was just doing what I could. Um, and, and I went nationally. So currently right now, we're in about 4,000 points of distribution in the U.S. We're the number one pickled bean in the U.S. Um, in the last four years. Uh, and uh, we're recently, we were featured in Forbes magazine um, for the fastest growing marinated vegetable uh, company. Um, and again, the one thing I want you, your listeners to understand, which is a nuance, is there's no other outside funding in the company, right? It is... Matt and Steve, that's it, right? Wow. Yeah. I, I, I read that in the Forbes article, and that is extremely rare to not have any type of round of funding, private equity, or going public. Like that's pretty unique for a company to have grown to the size that that you guys have. It, it takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of scrappiness. You know, when you think about, we don't have you know six, seven million dollars worth of marketing to spend on on product. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, if let's just say if they they give you a million or they give you five hundred thousand. You've got to be so analytical in terms of where and how to spend that money, because what you want to do is you want to create the best ROI, return on investment, right? So um, we we figured that out, uh, and uh, we're still trying to figure that out, and we're still changing. and And, and the U.S. is a little bit different as well, too. Um, it's very regional, so you've got to understand where your regional players are. You also have to understand, you know, some people don't know what a pickled bean is in mm -hmm. Washington State. Mm -hmm. but they but they know what it is in texas right yeah. so um and just understanding your demographics and, and uh I, I think that's that's very very important i would say as well i guess in the u.s too it's like caesars aren't as widely known i feel like i've seen it in florida on a menu bloody but... mary's bloody, bloody mary's, mary's or, or, bloody or mary's retired blood. canadians yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly <laughs> all the snowbirds down there in florida yeah, exactly yeah no, it's, 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 we just switch it. It's a Bloody Mary garnish. Got it. Got but it. also snacking as well too, because it's all natural. And that's, that's a space that we're, that we're in as well too. So um, really talk about the snacking and the all natural. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good call. Also, you guys are in some, some other forms now, right? Like in terms of product expansion, um, yep. what else um, you guys got going now? We've got asparagus, pickled asparagus. Nice. Um, we're now into the pickle business. So we've got uh, pickle spears and we've got baby dills. Um, so, you know, my team is, is working on that. So we're getting distribution uh, in Canada. Um, for the U.S. right now, we're really focused in on the beans right now. Mm -hmm. um, but with Canada, we've got Caesar Rimmer as well, too. So, you know, the portfolio is getting bigger. And then we got into the liquor space 
you know, two, yeah. three years ago. That was, wow. everybody was like, you guys are the king of Caesars. Why don't you just make your own Caesars? So we're <laughs> like, all right, we'll figure it out. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's another, uh, yeah, that's a big, uh, that's a big task that we're working on right now. And that is, that's a very different landscape because we're essentially going against a behemoth who's mm -hmm. bots. Yeah. Um, they've owned the category with 98% market share uh, for the wow. last, you know, yeah. 30, 30 years. Um, but we're having really good success. Uh, people are loving our product. The fact that it's a Canadian company and it's made in Canada. Um, and, you know, I, I think our, our Caesars taste better than theirs. So um, yeah, I, I mean, the liquid doesn't lie and that's what we're working on right now. That was a big hiccup was, you know, during COVID, we didn't have the ability to get liquid to lips yeah. um, for our Caesar business, but now we're we're back in full swing. And you know, you can find us at the LCBO and you can find us nationally across Canada with our Caesars as well, too. So yeah, the portfolio is not shrinking. It's 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 getting it's getting larger. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, so any exciting partnerships or innovations you wanna you wanna shout out that you have either recently happened or depending what you can tell, uh, that's coming up. Yeah. Um Innovations can't really say anything, but I would say partnerships. There's a lot of cool partnerships that are happening in um, in the U.S. So you know, Bloody Mary mix, the number one Bloody Mary mix out there is Zing Zang. Um, we're kind of partnering with them on a couple things. Tito's Vodka is another one mm -hmm. that we're um, that we're partnering with on a couple things as well too in the U.S. So um, you know, I, I'm I'm even looking at that and saying, you know, today I'll wake up in the morning and it's like, okay. Who do I want to try to create a partnership with? Who does our products work well yeah. with? And yeah. just cold call them um, and just talk to their marketing department or whatever department it is and uh, tell our story and um, and see if there's um, alignment there. Love yeah. there's, there's so many natural fits with your with your product, right? Maybe you are the guy that will finally get Americans to drink Caesars. Wouldn't that be the ultimate fit? <laughs> <laughs> I've always thought it was silly that they didn't. A Bloody Mary is not as good as a Caesar. I'm sorry. It's not. So, no, so it's maybe not. they'll figure it out. But it's not. It's tomato juice to me. But yes. Yeah. So maybe they'll figure it out. Maybe you're the guy that finally does it. That would be that'd be wonderful. Let's start uh, with Florida first instead start of with, let's start, start with Florida with, first. Yeah. I like it. I Let's like it. it. So one of the things that that we like to ask our guests is um, who their sort of brand crushes or a brand that they really like out there. You've spent a lot of time on the retailer side and big CPG and smaller CPG. So even from your childhood, right? Like you're you're very aware of what's on the shelves. So what is a brand that's out there right now that you really love? Their positioning, their product. It doesn't have to be anything related to work, but just something yeah. that you're like, wow, that's that's incredible. That's uh. I would break it down into two sectors. So I would say from a service standpoint, the brand that I love from a service standpoint is Starbucks. I think they are, they're so consistent. You cannot have a bad day going into a Starbucks because once you walk out, it's like the way that they greet you, the way that they talk to you, the aura when you walk in there, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's just, you know, they've done a really, really good job on. So I, I would say from a service standpoint, love Starbucks just super consistent like I think it was my wife uh, was was there probably two weeks ago and she went into a drive through and she forgot her debit card and they're like oh it's fine here's your you know caramel macchiato for free like they just gave it to her for free and I'm just like what <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like okay right like they're 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 a really good company for that I would say from a product perspective there's this pretty cool company out um, called is, um, Liquid Death. Have you heard of it? I have. No. Yes, they they're at, they were at uh, CHFA West and East, and I was very curious what the product was because the can, the name, all that they are absolutely exploding right now. I'm very intrigued by those by yeah. that too. Um, it's it's very much a different. Um, so essentially, what it is is it's canned water, right? Um, it's water in a can and they're trying to get rid of plastics, et cetera, for the environment. But just the fact that, you know, I've, I've tried their product in the U S just the fact that when you try it, you feel different. You're drinking water out of a can and it's this weird feeling of like coolness, but yeah. it's like, it's a different feel. The water tastes different. It tastes nice and cold. Like it's just for them to be able to crack something on such a sip on such a simple concept. Yeah. And where they are at now, I think their valuation is like 700 million. The last I checked, wow. yeah, um, they're taking over. But yeah, you, 
you guys got to check out Liquid Death. It's definitely a, a, a different product. That I'm really intrigued by them. I think they're, they've done a good job and I think they're going to continue to. Do. Yeah, absolutely. They're, Alex, you got to check out their social media. It's, it's pretty hilarious. Yeah, it's, it's pretty it's hilarious <laughs> and different. And like, uh, they're just super creative. It's a very interesting brand that I wasn't aware of. And, and ever since I discovered them as well, I'm like, Something like you said, very little differentiation. They've made it so different and and so unique, which is hard to do, right? Yeah, yeah. I think they're, they're they're kind of similar to like um, I don't know if you guys have heard. I think it's called Doctor Squash. I haven't. Heard yeah, that. I've uh, I, I I actually saw the CMO speak at Brand Week in one of the breakout sessions. Really Super good. interesting brand. Yeah, men's grooming um, company, and they kind of have the same type of marketing. Um, Got it. Yeah. It's like a little bit irreverent, kind of like, yeah, like very, humorous. Very, different. very like, whoa, okay. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't see that coming. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which is, uh, which is good. No, oh, that's awesome. Okay. One more question we want to ask and, and really it's more of giving you a forum to give advice to any of those, you know, early career people uh, listening kind of your soapbox. So whatever key thing you'd want to emphasize, give you the floor. Yeah, I, I, you know, I would say number one, um, happiness. Like it's it's such a word that's thrown around, but you know, you got to be happy at work. You have to be happy at work because then you're not going to be happy. When, so that correlates back into work life balance. But um, and um, and and try to have fun in everything you do. Like I know that there's you're going to go through ups and downs and 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 everything else, but I think. Having trying to have fun is uh, one of those things that just makes life easier. It's not like we're not doctors. Like <laughs> I sell beans. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a surgeon. Like I have bad days, but there's other people out there that are having you know yeah. worse days than I'm than I'm having. Right. The, totally. the 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 fact that I can get up and you know drive across the country or jump on a plane and you know go to California and sell beans. It's pretty cool. Right. Um, Definitely. Some people might be like, oh, my God. But, you know, those are the experiences. Right. So I would say have fun. Um, and, you know, early in your career, I would say work hard um, and, and learn as much as you can. I'm not a um, I hate reading. I hate reading. I'm one of those people. Where I would love to be able to read, you know, 30, 40 books. So what I do is I listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. like and analysis right like, <laughs> love it I, I no i do i listen to podcasts you know on my on my commute to work in the morning i find that yeah. in the morning, listening to podcasts whether it's you know the cpg guys just a bunch of other other things it could even be a self-help podcast um yeah. i'm always learning always learning like you know having these conversations it, it, to me I, I i love it right um i don't think you know a lot of us get enough of it especially in our day-to-day just to be able to sit back and just um, take in information and and listen to what other people's experiences are and um, and how they dealt with you know certain situations and things. So work hard, learn as much as you can, and have fun. I would say those are my top three things. If you can do that, you've had a good career. Agreed. Yeah. That's like great it. advice. Great advice. Well, Jamie, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate it. I know how much you missed us, me specifically. So I know this. Yeah, we never asked him who he missed more. Did no, yes. I, I, I brought okay. a box of tissues just in case I started crying. But okay, I, thank God I didn't have to use it. <laughs> yeah, we didn't put him on the spot. I think you know we've had such a good conversation. Let's not let's not force. We won't him. Do, we won't do that. To yeah, him. I don't want to force we'll, him into saying we'll me soon. ahead of you, and then we ended awkwardly. Yeah. So let's just let's yeah. just end well, it where it is. Thank you, Jamie, for coming on. Great <laughs> to see you. Wishing you guys continued success and and all the best to you and your family. Appreciate it, boys. And next time you're around, um, give me a call or shoot me a ring or do whatever. And uh, we'll meet up next time I'm in the West Coast. I got to come check you out. Yes, please. That'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to do some Caesars. There you go. Matt and Steve Caesars, though. Okay. 100%. Course. Only. Awesome. All right, boys. Thanks so much, Jamie. Have a Thanks, good Jamie. Bye. How was that, Alex? It was great. It was awesome to see him. He looks younger <laughs> he every time I see him, I feel. Yeah. It's impressive. Yeah. He's it's gotta uh, be the beans. It's gotta be the beans, right? I'm happy to hear like how well he's doing, right? Just a, an amazing guy. Loved working with him. He's crushing it. That company's growing out of control. So That's wild. Like he's effectively so well. doubled that business since getting there. I would imagine yeah. if you know four thousand doors, it's pretty much Canada, right? Like yeah, 
So yeah, awesome. huge, huge, huge growth. And yeah, it's just nice to see him doing so well and continue to do well. And the product itself is a great product. If you're out there, go get it, try it. It's it's wonderful. Like I said, hopefully he can be the guy that gets Caesars across the line in the US. Alex, he said a lot of great things in there. What was your key takeaway from it? I think one of the things I'm going to take away is that thought process for time management around hunting and farming. I thought that was, I like simple models to organize my thinking and my, and, and kind of my, my energy. So I thought the idea of moving between, you know, trying to drive things forward and, and, and the kind of mind state of a different type of work required to do that. And then moving into that more analytical optimization space um, and really keeping them kind of thought thoughtful and separated and intentional is a great, a great takeaway. And one I might try and leverage in my own self-management. So I liked that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was an amazing one. My, my first thought was when he said, be confident enough to bet on yourself. I love that thought process. A lot of times I think we get comfortable or complacent a little bit in our careers or just life in general. Right. And it's sometimes it's about taking those calculated risks and chances because you believe or you're confident enough in yourself that you can accomplish something. You can get 4,000 doors in the US. Right. You don't need um, to worry about working for a large CPG. Right. It's, it's how do you take those risks because you know that you can get something done and, and that's how you can be extremely successful. Awesome. I think the other piece of really great advice that he gave, you know, selfishly for us is listen to as many podcasts as you can specifically every episode that we're putting out i think that might be the actual key takeaway i want to i want to i want to overwrite mine uh and switch it to that <laughs> that is the one um, but uh but seriously guys uh if you are listening at this point in the cast a big thank you we appreciate anyone who's joining us on our learning journey and and you know again big thank you to jamie for making himself and his time available uh, and sharing his learning and, and his experience with us. Uh, do not forget to like and subscribe. Uh, follow us on any social, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, etc. And without anything else to add, uh, we will see you next time, uh, next week, with another great interview from another great guest. Bye, Thanks. guys.